Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of the FAMBO Stepping Stone Corridor Strategy. My name is Zoe Galdangelucci and I'm the head of programs at the Green Pop Foundation and I will be your moderator for this session. I have a master's degree from the University of Cape Town in Development Studies and eight years of experience working in the fields of sustainability, sustainable development and ecosystem restoration. I'm joined by Carrie Maria from the Table Mountain Fund, as well as Francis Taylor and Paul Huckman from Community. I will introduce all of them more formally as we proceed. So before we get started, I'd like to inform everyone that the session will be recorded and made available after our session today. We've enabled the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please do post your questions throughout the webinar. We've scheduled a few minutes at the end to answer as many as possible. So with the housekeeping out of the way, I'd now like to move on to introducing our topic for this afternoon, the FAMBO Stepping Stone Corridor Strategy. So the launch of this strategy is incredibly timely as it comes at the beginning of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which launched earlier this year. The UN Decade is a global rallying cry to heal our planet, which aims to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. This includes our very special Cape Floral Kingdom, one of the planet's smallest and most remarkable ecosystems. The Cape Floristic region is world famous for its vast, varied landscapes and its incredible diversity of habitats and species, 70% of which are endemic, found nowhere else on the planet. So the region has been identified as a biodiversity hotspot. In spite of its immense ecological and social value, the Fainbos biome is one of the world's most threatened ecosystems. Thankfully, community-led off-reserve Fainbos rehabilitation in Cape Town is gaining traction. In most residential areas, there are members of the public involved in greening private gardens and public spaces. In addition, various organizations in Cape Town have established off-reserve Fainbos conservation and rehabilitation programs targeting Fainbos habitats in community spaces. These include parks, schoolyards, places of worship, and areas along riverbanks, roads, and train lines. While well-intentioned, these numerous Fainbos rehabilitation projects tend to be isolated and uncoordinated, and as a result are limited in their impact. Each project has its own focus and goals, utilizes a different strategy, employs different rationale for plant selection and sourcing, and carries out different methods for monitoring, evaluation, and reporting. As a response to the situation, a group of Cape Town-based urban greening NGOs, the Green Pop Foundation, Community, and Inland Sunbird Restoration, funded by the Table Mountain Fund, established the Fainbos Corridor, Corridor Collaboration in 2018. Over the last three years, we have, in consultation with numerous stakeholders, developed a set of guidelines for coordinated Fainbos rehabilitation in Cape Town. We're excited to present these guidelines to all of you today, but first, we would like to screen a video from the Table Mountain Fund, which demonstrates the great value of the Fainbos biome. I'll just give my colleague one moment. There we are. The Cape Floristic region is home to almost 10,000 species. Of the 10,000 species, almost 7,000 of them are found nowhere else on Earth. It warrants its own floristic unit it should make you stop and think about just how special it all is. It's so unique in its makeup. It's just beautiful. I want future generations to be able to experience what I'm experiencing today. We've got a huge responsibility to conserve those species and to make sure that they exist in perpetuity. You've got to look at how people are engaging with conservation and with nature and to me that's an important aspect of Table Mountain Fund's approach. We're recognizing that our goal is not only to serve nature but also the people of the Cape Floral region, the visitors and the future generations and the four programs that have been selected essentially resonate well with our neighboring communities. The people who help implement the projects and really help us conserve the the fan boss. Bringing kids into the rivers and basically doing monitoring with them. In so doing, you're creating a love and understanding 
that which you know translate into pride so the kids take pride in what they see which then translate into them protecting it because nature has got that effect on you it changes the soul the inner being of you being in nature you change forever Feinbos provides rural communities in our area with an opportunity to access an economy. We are dependent on the interaction between those communities and the environment. And if we can do it through, through these business principles, where sectors adopts environmental principles and understand the ecosystem function, then we are closer to achieving our objectives to look after the environment. The ecosystems also provide important services. It's the provision of clean air, the provision of clean water, maintaining those corridors in the landscape so that your pollinators can move and respond to change. The incentives fund that Table Mountain Fund provides, especially for stewardship sites, goes such a long way. They've also supported ecotourism on these properties, helped with the building of hiking trails and signage so that we can provide access to the general public so that they can also enjoy these areas. Feinbos conservation is not going to be possible if we don't work together. So finding common threads, finding common values, caring together, if we can create hope in communities and a confidence that they can actually do something or make a change, then I think we've really got somewhere. When Table Mountain Fund says, we love people, we love nature, we want to connect them, they do that by bringing those people on board. Isn't that beautiful? Great, thank you so much, Carla. That beautiful video was made for the Table Mountain Fund 21 year celebration um, by an organization called Free Wild. Okay, so here to give us more information about the Table Mountain Fund and why this project was selected as part of their pride program is Carrie Maria. Carrie is a qualified ecologist with over 16 years of conservation management experience within the Cape Floristic region. Her early career specialized in systematic biodiversity planning, land use planning and decision making, and protected area network establishment in the government and parastatal sectors. In more recent times, and through her position as the manager of the Table Mountain Fund, her focus has shifted to one of community conservation, conservation finance and strategic direction, and collaboration within the famous conservation community. Thank you for joining us, Carrie. Over to you. Thank you and good afternoon everybody. It's really an honor to be here today and after the last year and a half it's really nice to have a project actually reaching this point. Um, I think we've all had a bit of a tough time and we actually shifted from traffic problems to um, load shedding problems so it really is good that we still managed to have these celebrations. Um, well I was asked to, to come and speak today to, to address you on why the Table Mountain Fund actually selected the project. I think it's important to keep in mind that Oh, now there's lightning and thunder outside, sorry. Um, this is a component of the Famous for the Futures project, which um, is a collaboration between these three organizations. And, you know, it's, it's, the project is about the development, the coordination, and essentially the marketing of a Famous um, corridor strategy, which hopes to link schools and community gardens and road verges to, to form these, these urban green spaces, these corridors, these natural areas, um, these arteries throughout the city of Cape Town. So for 23 years, the Table Mountain Fund has been supporting urban greening projects and garden projects such as these, but each of which is a, is a standalone project and rather a quite, quite piecemeal in nature. And um, the hope is that going forward, we could, we could actually expect our executives to align with this, with this umbrella strategy and ultimately contribute and collaborate to ensure the sustained viability 
of a Fanbus corridor strategy for the city of Cape Town. So in 2019, the Table Mountain Fund launched um, our new conservation strategy. I actually see the name above my head um, of one of our programs. And the Pride program is our, is our first program that went live. And the premise of this program is that, that people need to immerse themselves in, in Fanbus before you can expect them to appreciate it and to value it and to nurture it and to ultimately be custodians of it and become proud of that which is ours and, and nobody else's. Um, and the reality is if you, if you cannot get everyone out into the field, onto the mountains and into the Fainbos for these immersive experiences, then we're going to have to bring the Fainbos into your backyard, into your school garden, into your churchyards, into your streets, etc. So just to take the moment to say congratulations on the launch of the strategy. Um, Congratulations to Green Pop also for really establishing itself yourself as, as a go-between between, between um, the scientific authority and the Cape Tonians down on the ground. And congratulations to Community, Green Pop, and Ngungu for bringing the Fainbos to our backyards. We look forward to the strategy and we look forward to, to seeing it hopefully be given wings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, so now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic to Francis Taylor, who will be introducing the Fainwell Stepping Stone Corridor Strategy. Francis is the co-founder and director of Community, which was established in 2018. A need to feel healing in our social and ecological world, world drives her work life. Moments of sincere connection with fellow humans and our creatures restore her. She holds a master's degree in environment, sustainability, and society from the University of Cape Town, has five years of experience as an urban ecologist, and is the co-author of the Fainbell Stepping Stone Corridor Strategy. And after three years of hard work, I'm sure she can't wait to present the strategy. So over to you, Francis. Thank you very much, um, Zoe. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. Um, all right, so um, I'm very excited for today. Um, uh, this has been uh, many years in the making. So let's dive right in. Um, so we came together, um, uh, Green Pop, uh, Community, and Imu for three. Uh, aims. So the first aim was to make information on Fainbos more accessible. The second aim was to raise the standards of Fainbos greening using rehabilitation principles. And you'll hear more about that now. And then the third aim was to foster collaboration across the landscape. And um, later on this, in this presentation, I'll show you how. Um, all this work uh, we present today re revolves around the idea that we want more people to set up Fainbos Stepping Stone Gardens. Um, so today you will learn more on how, where, what, uh, and in terms of, of getting these, um, these programs underway. Um, what we've produced is a strategy. It's 100 pages, yes, uh, it's a lot. So don't worry, there's also a framework which is much smaller, to, uh, just more than 25 pages. And that um, is mostly pictures and diagrams. And then um, there's a very beautiful website that um, hosts the, um, the strategy um, and the framework, but also has some very nice tools, some really very nice tools. Um, so I'm gonna talk you through that now. Okay, so our work needs to be seen in the context of urban ecology. Um, urban ecology is the soil, water, plants, insects, birds, animals, and the humans within a city. Uh, the central part of this work is, is the, healing, the healing of relationships, the relationships between the different parts of our urban ecology. Um, and one part uh, of doing this uh, comes in the form of urban greening um, 
and we hope to encourage people towards doing that the Feinbos stepping stone way. Okay, why is urban ecology important? Uh, I think you would have tuned into this, you, you would have already, you're already well aware of this, but um, ecology in cities, it's essential to our health, essential to um, things like our water, food and medicine, but it's also important to our identity as people, as, as Capetonians, as Feinbos people. It's important to our social life and it's also important to our, our sense of, of well-being. Um, so through the strategy website and framework, the aim is to engage um, in both social and ecological issues as joint socio-ecological issues. All right. Um, let's then dive into uh, how a garden, any sort of garden, is different from a Feinbos stepping stone garden. Um, to, to understand this, there are three questions you need to ask yourself. So the one is, um, where do your plants come from exactly? This is a uh, crucial. So we want to know that um, the plants you're using in your Fainbow Stepping Stone Garden are from Cape Town and they're from the closest possible source to your site. The second question you need to answer is whether your garden is valued as an important part of the social life of your area if you're doing a public garden. It, it needs to be valued and appreciated by people. Um, and the third question to ask yourself is, is this garden planted and maintained with restoration principles in mind? Um, so basically, is this garden on a journey towards restoring the Feinbos ecosystem, ecosystem as a whole? All right, so making a Feinbos stepping stone garden is harder than gardening, but it's not impossible. And um, our work and the work of a number of other organizations working with, with Feinbos um, proves this. We, we work with community members, um, school kids, um, people from all walks of life, and um, it, it's definitely possible. Um, and our work is not perfect, it's still in progress, but it's better to get many people doing higher quality greening than to put all our energy into making a few perfect gardens um, in throughout Cape Town. Um, and that really is the heart of the work of the Feinbos Corridor collaboration. All right, let's then get into uh, being strategic uh, and, and some guidance on how to be strategic of your, in your greening. Um, so first, the three layers of, of the socio-ecological problem. <clears throat> the first layer is the, um, the loss of Feinbos. So if you have a look on, at the map on the left, you'll see all those different colors um, across the Cape Town landscape are the different types of Feinbos that we have in, in, in Cape Town. And um, if you look at the map on the right, you see where the color has been shaded out. That is where we have converted Feinbos and lost Feinbos to urban development and farming. Um, and that the, the map really shows the volume of Feinbos that we've lost. But it, um, if you look carefully, you can see that um, the, the Feinbos has also been broken up. The remaining Feinbos has been broken up into tiny little pieces that are isolated. They're all on their on, all on their own, which makes them vulnerable. So this is the ecological layer to the problem. That leads us to um, the next layer. Um, this fragmentation and loss of Feinbos has led to um, a lack of access to high quality nature. So on this map, you can see this is zoomed into Cape Town a bit more. Um, on the dark green, you see um, you can see the high quality Feinbos that is conserved and the pink shows access to nature. So the darker the pink, the closer people are to high quality nature. So it's clear that there's a lot of inequality in access to high quality nature. Um, then that, that lack of access to, to Feinbos is uh, compounded by socioeconomic limitations. So this map is from Adrian Fifth, 
for the census data. And um, this map is of uh, Cape Town's landscape. And you can see in, in green and blue, that represents people with a high income and people with uh, in represented in households represented in red and orange represent low income areas. Um, so um, what happens is that uh, in lower income areas, that's, uh, it becomes harder to, to access nature. You've got um, less money to, to access nature out, outside of your immediate environment. You've got less time and resources to um, invest in, in uh, improving Okay, um, and the third problem is that um, the, the people with uh, less income, um, I need to see the notes. Second. Sorry, everybody. We're just uh, retuning in from my other computer. I had a small issue. Friend will now continue. So, the the third issue is then that um, this uh, lack of um, socioeconomic resources really really limits your uh, um, ability to improve your area and regreen your area. Um, and as you can see, lower income areas are also denser and, and people have harder decisions to make in terms of um, what to do with your resources. So um, people also need to make the choice whether they, they need to attend to their food security um, or beautify the area. So what we've come up with is um, two approaches to, um, to this problem. The first approach is um, to, to take things one garden at a time. So this is for um, individuals and community organizations um, that really wanna work in their own area. So if you have a look at the map on the left, you will see that um, each of these pins in the map represent a garden. And this is over uh, on the left, you've got Table Mountain, and then you've got a couple of other fragments of green in the map. And you can see that garden by garden, um, community group by community group, um, the gardens are slowly linking the, the, the fragments of fainbos that are left in the, in the landscape. So that is, the, the, that is um, what you can do by linking your local project to the Fainbos Stepping Stone Garden Network on the website. Then um, the second approach is the high impact strategic river corridors approach. And that is for organizations that are larger and that are resourced and can really work across the landscape. And um, you can have a look on the website to see the exact methodology for coming up with these um, five river corridor priority areas. But um, basically they respond to the three layers of um, social and ecological needs that I've just outlined. Um, all right. So that's uh, greening strategically. We're now gonna go into um, the second part of what we offer, which is a how-to guide. Um, so here's an overview of what's in the guide um, and there's six parts to it. Um, this is available in the form of the strategy. It's also available in the form of the framework and then it's available step-by-step -step on, on the website. So the first part of it is selecting a site. Uh, the second part is assessing and imagining your Fainbos corridor. The third part is choosing plants, the most difficult part. The fourth part is designing your garden. Then number five, making a work plan. And number six, monitoring your progress. Select a site. So uh, there's a very nice tool online specifically to do this. Um, so Paul will talk about this a bit later. Um, but uh, for those that can't uh, surf online too long, there's also a printable version like this, which is basically a series of questions that helps you really consider where the best place within your 
of the different areas you could choose uh, which are going to be best uh, in the long run. So it's considering um, the size of, of the site um, and how well the, the, the site has in terms of its potential to, to connect to other sites. Okay. Then the second step, step is assessing and imagining. Um, and we've broken this down into three parts. So if you have a look on the left, um, this is where we talk about social needs. So, and then on the right, um, ecological needs. And what we've provided is um, a number of questions and, um, and guidelines to consider all the different ways you could respond to social needs and understand the social needs of your area. Um, and then similarly with the ecological needs of your area and the site. Um, what those two beautiful circles you see are the social benefit wheel and the ecological recovery wheel from the Society for Ecological Restoration. And it's a very nice tool in terms of um, fully understanding your project from the beginning um, and then step by step track, tracking your progress as you go. So um, that's very, very useful. And then um, the third part of uh, this, this step is um, uh, integrating your social and ecological needs into a single vision and mission. And we provided a couple of resources for that. Then we come to choosing plants. Um, and there's also a very nice online tool to help you through this process, give you species lists and show you where you can find the, the particular plants you need to make a Fainville Stepping Stone Garden. Um, but again, um, for those who can't uh, spend a lot of time online, here's also a step-by-step -step guide through um, some particular questions that help, can help you with this process. So it's about under, first understanding your fame, the history of your site and the fame boss that was there. Then um, choosing uh, step number two, choosing um, species of fainbos that respond to both your social and ecological needs that you've identified. Then step three, understanding the growing conditions of your site and, and thinking about how your plants are going to do in those particular conditions. Then the fourth step is organizing uh, your planting into a three-year process so that the the strongest plants go in first and the, the special species go in last so that you've got the best chance of success. Uh, then the last step is to consider non fainbos species um, in cases where uh, the fainbos has not been able to respond to all of your social and ecological needs. And um, this last part is to check that any um, species outside of the fainbos um, selection process are non-harmful in terms of being invasive or hybridizing with, with other fables. Then we move on to designing your garden. This is always a fun process. Um, and we provided um, a couple of guidelines as to, um, uh, and, and a check checklist. So you can, once you've designed your garden and, and merged your, your vision together, you can check that you're still responding to, to the, social needs and ecological needs of your area. And then we've also, if you, if you really want to go much deeper into the, the design side of things and upskill, we've also provided some links to some online um, courses that uh, help with this, um, improve your design skills. Then you get to, to the physical work and before starting, it's, it's always good to make a work plan. Um, and to help you with, with this, um, we've provided a couple of resources and, and guidelines on each step of the process. Um, and here's an example. Uh, this is an annual work plan so that you know uh, uh, at what time of the year should, you should be doing what activity. When should you plant? When should you should prepare? When should you grow? Um, so that you're working with the seasons and, and not um, experiencing uh, and have the best chance of success for your garden. The last step is then to monitor your progress and check that you're still on track. So this is a very nice part of the process because um, you get to see how much progress you've made and you get to just uh, check you're still, you're still moving forward. Um, so what you see here is an example of a checklist um, 
for you to use over the years to check that um, the, the plant biodiversity of your garden is continuously increasing and therefore getting stronger and also catering for, for more of the, the famous wildlife that we, we really all love and want to support. Um, yeah, so, so the, that's a, a brief overview of both um, how to green strategically and, and the nitty gritty of actually how to, to make yourself a famous stepping stone garden. Um, so looking forward, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we, we've done the work of, of taking um, knowledge that uh, has previously been really more for specialists and in the universities, and we made that publicly available. And, and we really provided a lot of uh, tools that will enable people to network and work together a lot across the landscape. So what you've got in front of you is what I think um, we should be focusing on next. So this is a, a garden that uh, community did with, um, with neighborhood gardens in Salt River. It's the Chatham garden. And um, you can see the before and after. Top left is before and bottom left is the after. And you can see uh, an area that was actually a dump site and really a, a neglected space um, has become really, very beautiful through art and through greening. Um, and the important part of this is, is that um, at the time of creating this garden, um, the, there was a need to respond to uh, additional food insecurity in Salt River that was brought on by COVID. So the garden, the garden is in a pure Fainbos garden, but it's, um, the, the center of the garden is a vegetable garden, um, which attends to the social needs of, of people in Salt River. But there's also a, along the, the border supporting the, um, the hedge. If you look at the top right, you can see a number of um, Fainbos species have been planted. And there's even an endangered um, protea species included in there. So um, spaces can respond to both social and ecological needs if you go through the process of carefully considering how to integrate them. Okay, so that is the, the strategy, how to be strategic in your greening and exactly how to go about doing it. Paul is now gonna show you the very beautiful website it's made. Thank you so much. I wanna just do a quick introduction of Paul so that he gets his credit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis, for the wonderful presentation. Um, as Francis mentioned, there are a number of digital tools that were developed to help guide the general public and urban greening organizations in the implementation of methods outlined in the strategy document. So to introduce these tools, I'm going to hand over to Paul Hochman. Paul is passionate about open collaboration initiatives, exploring the challenges and opportunities around urban sustainability and learning from and about nature. Paul is the co-founder of Community and is in charge of web tools. He is responsible for all the fast, fantastic online tools you will see today to support you in your Fainbos rehabilitation. Over to you, Paul, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Zoe. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, I will walk you through the website. So I'll share my screen in a second. Uh, and you can also check it out, this out online on the website that has just been relaunched that existed in a previous format until now and is now available um, in its new shape and form. So I should now be sharing my screen. And before I show you around on what we've done and how it works, um, maybe important to note that this website is actually um, bigger and more complex than we thought before. Um, we, uh, we have this interesting strategy and we knew that this was a strategy we wanted to share in a web format. So the initial idea was to, to create all this um, knowledge in a format that people can browse but at the same time at community we actually have uh, quite a number of online tools and, and mapping systems on our own website and as the fcc developed we figured that the best place for these tools and, and maps to be available at is not our own website but instead this communal um, collaboration website so we decided in restructuring the fcc website that we best migrate a number of these tools and embed them within the FCC site. So this is in a way a mix of the actual strategy and a number of tools that we hope 
are useful for people to play with and, and use online. So let me get going. Um, on the FCC site on the homepage, you right away see the strategy document. So that is, of course, the, the big document that we've spoken about before, and I highly recommend you just check that out and read through it. Um, but let me first start with this section on famous corridors, which has a number of things that Fran has mentioned before. Um, and here you see uh, some explanation and details, but most importantly, you see that we have listed a network of gardens that are available online and that include currently 27 individual stepping stone gardens from the three founding organizations. And you can see there in a number of areas in Cape Town, you can browse the map, see where they are, click on any one of them and see what's, what's happening there. Um, there is a list below with photos and a, a list further down with uh, a breakdown of what's happening. Any garden has a profile where you can read more about it, who's doing what, what's happening, and a number of profiles and other useful links to explore exactly um, in what context this garden is set up. So that is one element of our, our um, gardens. But of course, the idea is that we don't want to limit these gardens to just having gardens that the three funding organizations have, have set up. We really want to create a wider collaboration and we invite people to add their own garden. So there is a section here to add your garden. Um, there are some um, requirements for people. Um, we need your garden to be a famous stepping stone garden. We explain here what the requirements are and we're going to figure out as we go along what the best way is to manage this. But you fill out this form and send us the details of your garden and we'll get in touch to add your garden to our online listing. And that means it will be taken into account in our mapping and in our corridor building. And you can really become part of this wider network in which we really figure out how do we connect places and nature and people. So, and if you don't have a garden, we invite you to consider starting one. And now that is of course where the strategy um, comes in place, right? To start your own garden. Now, if we go to our famous rehabilitation section here, that is basically the entire strategy formatted in a series of six steps that you can see here. Um, we are linking to the strategy and having a number of um, pieces of chapters in here, but there's also two online tools that make it easier to not just read, but to engage with the system. And that is most importantly in the site selection, that's the first one. So imagine that you consider uh, an empty plot in your neighborhood or uh, building a garden around a school. There are a number of things to consider as described in the strategy and the site helps you to, to view that and to understand it. So imagine that you have that, that place to start analyzing the site, you go to our map and you click wherever that, that garden is. So if you are considering a place in, I don't know, let's say a place right here, you confirm the location, and then the system runs an analysis on that location. So what it does is it, firstly, it analyzes, it says, this is your original vegetation type. Then it draws a circle, uh, a one kilometer radius around your area. And it says, let us analyze what's happening in that area. So you see a number of colored patterns in there that relate to the things that you see here. So there is an existing remnant in this area, um, an existing Cape Flats and Fainbos remnant. That's actually the Kenilworth race course. There are a number of parks in here and there are pieces of river in there. And we consider all those elements important when you start to consider a location for your garden. Now in here, you can go down and you can see exactly what the, the details are. So which parks are there? This, this place has six parks, although no childhood development centers, no community centers, no cemeteries, all of which we consider potential expansion stepping stones. So we don't want you to see your stepping stone as an individual garden. When you plan it, we want you to think of it as something that can grow into something bigger by linking it with nearby other gardens. So you need to know what are places to potentially grow into and to link with. Um, at the same time, it, it tells you what are connectors in the area. Those are rivers and railways. And we see there is one piece, 768 meters of Crumbum River within the one kilometer radius. So again, that tells you something about the options to, to use that river if you were to green along that river with indigenous vegetation and connect to other places. And as we said before, we've seen that there is some Cape Flats and Fainbos remnant also within your area. 
Now we give some, some general indications. Is this great, okay, or bad in terms of how much we, we, we see here? And that should give you an indication of the suitability of the site. It's not um, science you should take for granted. It's something you, that's just an indication that helps you guide your decision making. If you know that 10 of your neighbors are keen to make their own private gardens into stepping stones, that's fantastic and the system wouldn't know. Um, so in any case, once you've considered the site and you feel that this is great, you can go on to the next step, which is then your assessment. And here we embedded a number of these parts from the strategy and you can read through them and you can go as deep into this as you want, or you can do a, a more, a brief assessment, but that's something that you do uh, by yourself in the way you see fit. But our next step is again an online tool. So if I go to the next step, which is choosing plans, then we see the second tool. Now this second tool recognizes the place that I have selected before, and it says, well, based on the on the location, we know that this is Cape Flats and Famous, Cape Flats and Famous, and we invite you to first of all read about the vegetation type. So in the system we have from, from literature and reports, we have information we pull in and we highly recommend you to get familiar with your vegetation type. If you don't know about this, there are so many vegetation types in Cape Town and they're different and unique and special. So read about them, get familiar with them. But then once you have a general idea, get familiar with the plants. And the interesting thing is that all these vegetation types have different specific plants that originally occurred in there. Now the system automatically makes plant lists for you. So we have two sections, one that is plants based on social value and one that is plants based on ecological value. So if I wanna make a food garden, I should check out what are edible plants within Cape Flats St. Fainbos, because that means that I get the right species for my location and I have social value that I get from there. Now, and here you then see that each of the plants has a, uh, you see some photos, you can also see it in table format, and you can open each of the species to see a further profile on, on what a plant is about, other resources, and how to grow them. Now you can do the same with medicinal plants um, in terms of social value species, and at the same time you need to consider your ecological function. And again, this is all explained in the strategy, but the idea is that you pick species in a certain order, starting with your pioneer species, which are listed here. Um, and as you grow and expand your garden, you can decide to focus on insects or on birds, or you can graduate to climax species. So it's all about what, what works for you and your plans for the garden. But the system really gives you a very handy way to browse and start making lists. And there's really a lot of information in here. And we must thank our partners that helped um, put these lists in the system. There's a lot of, there's so many species and it's a lot of work. And we have a number of vegetation types that have nice lists and we're still working on the other ones. Um, but you can see big parts of the Cape Flats where most of us work. They have some good lists and this should hopefully help you pick the right species. Now you can then go to the next steps, which are design, make a work plan and monitor, which all come in simply from the strategy. So, um, other than, than that section, we also have resources in here. And I would like to highlight firstly the maps section. So in the map section, we put together a number of maps that come from a variety of sources and that could be helpful in your work. So a number of these are used in different shapes and forms in the different sections that you've seen just now, but you can also browse them in and of themselves. And you see here first the outline of Cape Town, but there is a number of, of maps that you can open here. Um, and something we haven't seen before, let's have a look. Existing so you, you can browse here um, and you can, for instance, load Bionet, which is a very interesting city of Cape Town project um, to create a biological network in Cape Town. And here you see how that is set up. Um, there is also another one, let's say, for instance, if I go down, you can click on the individual maps and see them individually. Um, for instance, groundwater recharge is an interesting map on the levels of groundwater recharge in the city to see how relevant uh, the recharge is for the site that you're considering. So there's a lot of maps and um, we recommend you check them out, see what's in there. 
Um, then we also would like to note that the strategy and a number of other interesting documents are in a document section, uh, including here you see a bird guide, um, a number of assessment tools and other handy tools for working with schools, how to run a volunteer day, and of course the actual strategy itself and the framework that, that uh, Fran mentioned just now, that is a very condensed version of the strategy steps. So yeah, other than that, we have the species lists that allows you to search for species um, manually. So you saw before that I had a, a specific list for a specific vegetation type. Um, that is one way of looking at it, but you might have very specific needs that you want to dig deeper into the species list. Use this tool. So you can say, listen, I would like uh, species that attract butterflies and that are easy to grow. But I would also like to make sure that they are, um, let's see, suitable for clay soil. I have no idea if I get too specific here, um, but I can see all of the uh, species that have all of these features uh, or that have one of them. So let's see if there's any plant that is easy to grow for butterflies and that is in clay soil. Here we go. We actually have two species um, that are suitable for my needs there. So um, that is just one example. You can browse by genus. You can um, browse by vegetation type, browse by family. So there's a lot of info in here. Um, and we have, let me have a quick look, 1,075 species in there. It's a lot, but it's not nearly enough. So we're still working on this. And any people that have species lists and details of it, please let us know. We're very keen. And again, very grateful for the help we've received so far. Um, and then lastly, the, the tool that I showed earlier to pick a site, which was part of the famous rehabilitation, it's also an independent tool that you can use if you don't want to go through all the steps, but you just want to check out um, maybe your existing garden and you just want to check out what's, what does my profile look like, what is available near me, etc. So there's a, an option to, do, to run that independently as well. Now, um, last point is if you want to engage with us, in, in addition to adding your garden to the system, we also recommend you check out some WhatsApp groups that exist that you can join. They, a number of them revolve around specific gardens uh, or garden groups that already exist, and you can simply join them um, and help with those gardens. So check out what we have on here. And we also have a Fainbos Growers and Fainbos Connectors WhatsApp group. So if that is of your interest, please um, let me know. Um, please check it out. And also please note that the green infrastructure plan um, is currently being developed by the city and our work is being connected to that. So we wait for that uh, green infrastructure plan to be completed. And it is really one of the things we're very excited about to add as a layer to our system and to show people what is in the green infrastructure plan and how can gardens connect with that. So that is uh, some of the plans for growth. And I think I'll leave it at this, Zoe. So back to you. I hope it all makes sense. And I invite everybody to visit the website when they can. Thank you so much, Paul. The comment section is just blowing up with lots of people very excited. So I think your tool has definitely sparked some interest in this project. Um, I think all of us will agree that this will be so useful in the years to come. I know that Green Pop is going to be using it extensively. So well done. Thank you again. Uh, now we're actually going to move over to a little Q&A. There are a few questions in the question and answer box. And I also had a few coming through on Facebook Live. So I think I'm going to start with one question that came up a few times. Um, and this one is directed at um, Francis. It was answered um, in the chat by um, Shirk Perks, but I thought maybe you guys could give a little bit more insight. Um, and this is whether your entire garden needs to be Fainbos in order for it to be considered a stepping stone garden, or what is the percentage of Fainbos that it needs to be? Um, so that is something uh, that we would need to, there's no, there's no um, exact science to that yet. And that's something we would need to develop going forward. But um, I think uh, uh, to start with, use your discretion and say, okay, um, how can I um, maximize the amount of variables I have in this space? 
um, while still um, keeping the space something that's useful and appreciated um, for all its other functions. So, so we're working outside of nature reserves. We don't have the option outside of nature reserves to have places, large pieces of land that are purely famous. So we need to find that way of coexisting with other types of greening. And um, yeah, please do, um, do try, do your des designs, work through the framework, framework and see where, where you get to. And then please do give us feedback because this is a critical question going forward. Like how do we meet our social needs and our ecological needs at, at the same time? So yeah, please go for it and, and um, let's feedback and keep the conversation going. Great, thank you, Francis. Um, so another question that came through on Facebook Live was how can Stepping Stones, how can the Stepping Stones project help to conserve endemic area specific fame boss like Tigerberg, Tigerberg or Nosterfeld fame boss and help that it doesn't mix with Strandfeld fame boss that acts like weeds? Do you, you or Paul potentially have an answer for that one? So, that's why we, we've designed the, the framework um, process in a way that um, when you first select your site, um, the species list that comes up, it brings up the species very particular to your area. And then um, the second part that really defines, um, a, that helps define a fame ball stepping stone is where exactly you get your plants from. So it's really about, um, being open to different types of greening, but also when, when, it, when it does come to fambles, actually being quite um, careful and strict with, with where you're getting your plants from. Once you've made that choice and, and, the, uh, and you're working within your vegetation type, you, you're doing well, but then take that extra precaution to make sure that you're getting your plants from a restoration nursery. And um, nurseries, we've given a list of ones that, that um, care to work with in vegetation types. And to just quickly add to that, um, at the community site, we currently have a logging and tracking system of, of plants that allow people to know where the plants came from. And that's really important for that, ensuring that the genetic mixing doesn't take place. It's not yet on the FCC website, but we plan to make a similar tool available so that people can better keep track of where do plants come from that they have in their garden. Brilliant, thank you both. So that also answers another question that came up about um, appropriate fame boss nurseries. Um, there was a question from Carol Thompson about whether there's an appropriate fame boss nursery registered as a vendor with the city of Cape Town. I'm not 100% sure of that, but as Paul mentioned and Francis mentioned, there is a list of recommended fame boss nurseries within the strategy document. Um, so if you look in there, we have recommended a few that we think um, are the best places to source your fame boss. So you can, you can check that out. And then um, if those can be registered as vendors with, with the city in the future, that would be, that would be great. So uh, the next question is around um, a specific project that Tracy Lee Lawson is running. It sounds very exciting. She said, hello, and thanks for this really great initiative, managing a large coastal complex in Musenberg East with a multicultural community. I'm doing my best to decrease lawns and increase Cape Dune Strandfeld tracks and I'm slowly getting there despite very limited budget. However, my biggest challenge is trying to motivate awareness and appreciation within the community. Tools to engage the community with this process would be so appreciated. Um, they have two conservation areas within the estate, one of which is a wetland. So I would say um, we don't have a lot of tools for engaging specifically with the community at this point, but one of the the plans for the uh, website is to be able to continuously add resources like this so one that is already on the website is how to run a greening day. Um, at Green Pop, we try to involve the community with planting as much as possible. So we would all, always recommend planting with the people in the community so that it's not just a project running on the side. Um, you can find the re running a greening day guidelines on the website. Um, and we will be adding more and more resources about um, working with communities. Um, we also recommend looking into the concept of placemaking, which we haven't really gone into very much within the strategy, but it is an important thing to keep in mind when you're doing urban greening projects in, um, in areas with lots of uh, diverse uh, community aspects. Okay, is there anything you wanna to add to that, Paula Francis? 
I would I would just add that um, they already um, in Mulhouse already got some some work going uh, in the Musenberg area and um, uh, um, the the in does great work so I think it would be superb to to connect with them and see what tools they already have because they're, they're incredibly creative with the way they engage with paintball so I really think they would be a, a great um, next step for you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, a few more questions here. Um, Louise Ferreira uh, said to maybe mention that the city's policy is that if your site is within two kilometers of a nature reserve, you must use plants that were propagated with plant material collected from no more than 20 kilometers from the site. Collection and grower permits can be applied for with Cape Nature. Also, there are rehabilitation experts who have the necessary permits. We are using a rehab specialist who is propagating 5,000 plants for our rehabilitation project just to get us started. So thank you, that's great advice. Okay, um, question for Paul and Francis. Which urban elements are considered a corridor? I think we've spoken a little bit about the spines of corridors, but would you like to say anything else, Paul and Francis? Um, so you get corridors in different forms. Um, so um, the ones that we focused on today, which um, is um, most appropriate for us members of the public, um, are Feinbos stepping stone corridors. Um, I think what you're asking is, um, uh, is about the, the continuous corridors and, and those would be um, rivers. Um, be, because they're continuous and, and they're basically already like highways for animals moving across the landscape. The whole lot of uh, hidden life moving along rivers, otters and all sorts of things. Um, but you also get um, the corridor feel or the corridor um, function out of other linear um, infrastructure, such as um, uh, road verges, because they're also linear and they work along the landscape. Um, train um, the, the, the train lines and the green areas along them. Um, and then any other um, uh, infrastructure that's linear, I can't think of any more now, but anything that would actually work across the landscape and give you a continuous um, bit of green can be um, considered a corridor and then greened with Fainbos to, to provide a Fainbos corridor. Um, yeah. If you want to know more about um, stepping stones, if you just uh, Google stepping stone corridors, then you can see exactly how they wor work and how they support um, flying insects and birds across the landscape. Great, thank you, Francis. Um, just two more questions. So the first is uh, public parks don't seem to be included in the list. Are these an option? Let's say definitely. However, if it is a park, then it need, you need to get permission from the city in order to work there. So I would just say the important thing is to make sure when you are doing site selection that you have appropriate permissions from whoever owns and manages that land before you start any type of project. That is critical. Um, Paul? Um, in fact, parks have been loaded as a shapefile in our mapping system. So when you do your site selection, you see the parks that are around you, whether or not you can link with the parks and whether or not the parks have famous, we don't know, but we do see them as potential sites and we would highly recommend that you get in touch with your local park manager to discuss options. They are great places and it's lovely to work with them. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. And the last question is from someone who doesn't live in Cape Town and asking how they can use or support the tools in the project. Um, so I would say in general, some of the resources on the website could be useful in places other than Cape Town. Obviously, most of this is related to Feinbos, which is specifically in Cape Town, which is why it's so special. But if you uh, are living somewhere else, um, it's still possible to use tools on running an urban greening day or um, various other things that we're going to be uploading to the website over time. And of course, you can always follow along with what we're doing and offer support in any way that you can um, when we request something specific. Paul? Uh, also to note that the website is open source. All the code is on GitHub. Um, and it is made specifically for Cape Town, but there's no reason for someone with some programming knowledge to take the website and, and load all kinds of maps for their own city. 
the code is there and free to use for everybody. Great, thank you, Paul. And we had one more question come in that is very interesting. So I think we'll just do this one and then we'll end with that. It's from Gail Brown. And she said, I've been gardening on the railway line for 20 years and it's a specialized environment as it's so disturbed and so little soil at first, we just threw plants at it. And now we're being more selective with plants, but many famous plants get stolen. So it does limit what can be used. So Francis and Paul, I know Community has done a lot of work in open public spaces where security may be an issue. Do you have any advice? Yeah, I mean, Gail's been doing such fantastic uh, work for so long, it feels um, tricky to advise, but I will say that um, from, from our experience with um, working in public spaces that, um, that you do have plant theft and that is something that, that we factor into the number of plants we put in. So um, what we try and do is ma make the plants that are, are more sensitive and more harder to get hold of, we, we try and uh, embed them within some other plants. Um, what you could also do is um, watch out for the time of year when the, the plants start looking um, start looking beautiful and just uh, watch out for them because mo most, most, uh, it's mostly in spring when you, when you lose plants. And you could also, it might be counterintuitive, but you could also prune your plant in a way that it doesn't look that pretty <laughs> so that um, it's not that desirable as something you, you would want to make your garden pretty, but it still functions as something that's nice for, for insects and birds. So that's a couple of things we, we've done, but I would just say like from our side, like if you keep growing, don't get disheartened by people stealing your plants. I mean, you, you've done 20 years of great work. I think if you just push on with the fame boss, it, it, will, it, will, it will take root. Great, thank you. Um, the last, okay, every school should get it, agreed. <laughs> and one last question, who are you sharing this information with? Everyone. We would like everyone in Cape Town to be privy to all of this information and have more knowledge about famous gardening. If you're starting with no knowledge, we hope you gain a little bit of something from this and can improve your garden in a small way. And if you're already an expert, we hope that the tools help you to make your work more streamlined and easier, an easier process. Um, okay, so we're gonna close the question and answer section with that. Thank you everybody for your questions and for this great discussion. And thank you so much for all of your comments. So many, so many interesting comments in there as well. If we missed anyone's questions, I apologize. Um, you can always get in touch with us via the website if you have specific questions and you want to speak to us. Um, so now I just wanna acknowledge some of the contributors um, for the FameBoss Corridor collaboration. So the development of the FameBoss Stepping Stone Corridor strategy has been a collaborative endeavor between many individuals and organizations in Cape Town, South Africa over the last three years. These individuals include Nadine van Sale from Community, who is the co-author of the um, strategy with Francis. Um, and then our various contributors are uh, Kainwin Smith from Inunu, Dion Lowe from the Green Pop Foundation, Julia September from Community, Peter Brom from Backyard Ecology, Sabello Mamani from Friends of the Liesbeck. And then we had various people review our strategy um, at several points during its development. Um, Carla Wood and Carrie Maria from the Table Mountain Fund, Emma Jones Philipson from the Green Pop Foundation, Ismail Ibrahim from Sanbi, Jan Kotsi from WWF, and um, MJ Grobler from the Green Pop Foundation, Patrick Dowling from WESA, Pippin Anderson from the University of Cape Town, Pat Holmes independently, Sherk Krietz from Inunu, and Sue Bellinger independently. So by generously providing their time and valuable knowledge and enthusiasm, these individuals and organizations have contributed towards a shared vision of a city where people and fame boss can thrive together through a restored relationship between people, insects, birds, and plants. We are grateful to the num numerous contributors, collaborating organizations, reviewers, planning and workshop participants and community members for their support and the endless inspiration they provided during the completion of this strategy. We would like to extend a special thanks to the Table Mountain Fund for funding this project. This work wouldn't have been possible without you. So truly, thank you so much. Uh, we'd also like to thank the city of Cape Town for their guidance and support in this process. It is our hope that this strategy will foster a sense of pride in our natural heritage and be widely used as a valuable resource to guide well-planned urban greening in Cape Town. So we'd love to invite everyone to use the tools that we've created and share them widely. 
As Paul mentioned, all of the resources that we've created are under a Creative Commons license and can be freely used. They are open source. For organizations professionally engaged in Thainvos restoration in Cape Town, we'd like to ask you to join the Thainvos Corridor collaboration as a partner. Um, so currently we have the three organizations as partners. We would love to expand that to include more organizations that are working in this space. Um, and you can contribute your best practice resources and your strategic guidelines, et cetera. Um, you can find more information on what this entails on the contact page of our website. For individuals or, or organizations working on building Thainville Stubbingstone Gardens, we'd like to encourage you to register your garden on the FCC website so that it can be included in the Stubbingstone Corridor Network. And we'd also love to invite everyone to subscribe to our newsletter on the website so that we can keep you updated on Thainville's restoration events and new resource uploads. Thank you so much again to everyone who made this project possible. And thank you for joining us this afternoon, evening, or morning if you are somewhere else. And with that, we are going to bring the webinar to a close. Good night. <laughs>